So welcome to Margaret McDonald. Um, and thanks, Margaret, for coming today. Uh, she's just getting her PowerPoints ready for everyone listening in. Um, and how are you going? Excellent. I'm going to take myself off video and you can take it away, Margaret. Right. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. I feel like I'm in the um, room with old friends and that's very, very pleasant. <laughs> um, and I... Um, just getting this centered in the screen. I, I just, I started thinking about the coaching world as I was um, just trying to get the right view, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, I know what I've done. I've got up the PDF. Excuse me for a moment. I saved it as a PDF. Do you need a hand, Margaret? I'm just um, getting rid of the... Can you see a normal view or have you got a side view as well? Um, we can see the diff... It, it, yeah, it looks like we can still see the PDF, yeah. This should be the slide view. You can, can't see that now. Sometimes it takes a little while to come up. So can you see it now? I did send it to you. Okay. Do you want me to upload that? So you can't see it? I, I've obviously... I, we can see it, but we can see the PDF, not the slide view. Oh. I've closed that. Okay. You might need to close it and then uh, shut your share and then reshare the right one. Yeah. Oh, that's what I didn't do. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, for those who haven't met me, I'm um, a leadership and um, consultant and coach. And um, I I'm coming through a couple of lens, not only the coaching experience, but also from the perspective of leadership, because I have, through the whole time of this chaos, been thinking um, about all of the things about our society that are um, really preventing us from being, uh, from being able to work effectively. So in preparation for this, for the whole year, I've been looking at things from the whole system and policy sector and thinking, how is that affecting the disruption for people and who is being supported and who not? And um, I've also been thinking about service providers, not only those who are in business as uh, providing the professional services like Oh, accountants and lawyers and, and um, you know, bankers and, and all of those people, but range of coaches and, and um, therapists and um, doctors and all of those people and how they've been able to work or not work in this time. So I've talked to a range of people about what it's meant for them. So I just reflect a little bit on that and some common themes what it's meant for our sectors, for clients, um, what it says about the systems and well, how we might think in the future because I, having had a lot of work with systems and policies before, I know how, I know how um, amenable they are to change if we know how to do it. And unfortunately, not many of us know how to do that. And it takes a lot of effort and it takes time but it is like a tap dripping on a stone. It does wear away the stone. So um, I, the issues that um, we've come across that we've all experienced is of course, of course, originally the general shockwave. 
people, um, individuals and businesses have got this fear of the future. Um, as uh, you mentioned earlier, Renee and Neville, the anxiety that's been produced is, is sort of a, the source has been many and varied because it's a, it, it's a, um, you know, a complex uh, emotion. And there's also been confusion. What do I do? Um, because the messages have been clear to the people who are giving them, but not necessarily to the panoply, panoply of, of, of the recipients. Um, the spectre of unemployment, the fact of unemployment, the fact that people have slipped into mental health crises um, when they might have been able to manage their health before. Um, so, and as part of it, um, the, the professional services in particular have, have thought, can I keep going? And going through this, this period of, of um, discombobulation about whether they get any government support, I didn't because I didn't set myself up for it, did I? Um, and uh, would they, um, how much can they keep staff on? What do they do if they can't? And, you know, many small businesses weren't eligible or only some of their staff were eligible. In this society which has supported, um, you know, casual work and, and decreased the support for uh, keeping people in long-term jobs for businesses, then so many people aren't eligible, not just the businesses, but people. And, you know, I've had a little bit of contact with the... Uh, industry, the entertainment industry, and all of the outwash from that, in, and also students, in, international students who are left high and dry. It is just abysmal. And they do need services. So um, people who are providing services to business that have helped them get through this crisis, they've been pretty okay. Um, the life coaches who had lots of contacts They've been pretty okay, but they've given a lot of free services. Um, consultants, they've been saying things like, my business has fallen off the cliff. And so uh, it's been pretty impactful for them, even though they know organisations need them. Uh, the leadership and executive coaching, slowed or postponed, it's seen not as essential as other kinds of supports. Um, and business coaches, if they're supporting businesses, they've been okay, but they've been able to see the, the shock waves and the confusion and the worry for businesses because everyone's finally getting the idea about, although we've been talking about it for a long time, that this truly is a volatile and uncertain world and we are going to have more and more shocks. So... <clears throat> One area which has surprised me, and I think it has an impact on us all as service providers, is that people in situations of providing services are having a feeling ill-equipped to deal with the levels of client anxiety, grief, and just paralysis that they're experiencing. They cannot support their clients well enough for the clients to benefit. And I've met a couple of lawyers who have said, we just don't know how to support them to get out of this paralysis and they need to do this because it's urgent. So I think that says something about the systems and, you know, we just aren't able to connect with these people yet. Um, a lot of their services are still resolving the, the crisis issues that we, the, you know, the catastrophes that started earlier in the year because this came along so quickly afterwards. So, and businesses don't know who to contact for support and frequently their clients probably are not feeling very financial as well. This again is a comment on our service supports and where services are funded from. So there are a lot of people out there who can provide services who are not, who are underutilized and are not giving support. Um, many of us would have provided services free but we weren't aware of the need. And as services, it's telling us that we all don't have enough understanding of where we go to for support 
where people could come from and where we could refer on. So I think it's saying to me that I, at least in my local area, need to be more understanding of the whole service system and be able to map that out more for clients. So the clients are experiencing this sense of, I need help. I don't know what kind of help I need. Um, I don't even know how to think about it. Who will tell me? Often people can't tell them. We've had a whole society, including our school years and even coming from the industrial era, has set up this sense of competition between us. You know, we've got this sense of scarcity and within and without sectors. And often we have a sense of, this is my turf, you don't touch it, and um, or you're a competitor, so keep out. And there's, um, and the people who are highly technical in their services don't really feel comfortable with referring to people they believe are less technical. When I've, had, when I've been evaluating mental health services around the country, I know that frequently um, medical services would not uh, refer people to essential supports once that once they're out of intensive medical support like a hospital or um, you know acute care support of some kind and they wouldn't refer on to carers or home services and those kinds of things so deeply is that attitude held and it has worried me forever all of those things were magnified during this period and made more obvious to people so I think this atmosphere of rivalry is a toxin and it's not going to help us deal with the future shocks which are coming. You know, as the climate change is going to be the source of many more of these viruses, um, the uh, new viruses are being found in the melting ice that haven't been unearthed for millennia and we don't know what they're going to do. And uh, as part of this too, clients are dealt with like body parts. I can do this bit. When really some of the root causes are they don't have, um, if they don't get enough money, if their job disappears or if their, um, you know, extra support disappears through job seeker, they can't pay the rent anymore. And that is... The, the root cause of the anxiety, or it is the relationships in the house have become too stressed. So we've got this crisis in service provision um, that affect us individually as services, but also as the system. And so knowing that in this situation, people's needs are frequently become more complex, they're multi-causal, and what's our response? Do we know? how to join in the com complex servants supports they need. Personally, what I've come across are the needs to address the building of resilience, change mastery. I've been doing a lot of research on change and particularly our different styles of change. Um, you know, we've all grown up on the early adopters and, and those kinds of movements. We've, we've looked at how change happens or doesn't happen in organisations. We've looked at, at the general, but in the particular, each individual has their own style of change. And I've become very aware of this because in coaching people who um, have really, they've been in work, but they need to change their work, that this has caused a transition. But they might be the sort of people who really need to control their world and they can they need to have the change designed so that they can digest it other people are happy to jump in and sink or swim but a lot of people aren't and there are many many um, subtleties to this so I'm finding that even in my coaching world a lot of the people I talk to are not as aware of that as I thought because when one thing's change one thing's change, there are many ripples and there are many um, stones in the way of the river which 
call all sorts of side effects. So it's a very complex thing. Maintaining morale generally has been a very difficult thing because anxiety and depression are catching. Um, people sometimes at a different level just need someone to help them digest and think through the situation. If my mother can't babysit the kids because she's had cancer treatment and um, she can't do that anymore, how do I survive? How do I balance life and work? What are my options? How do I confront my workplace and tell them this? Can I persuade them that people often don't think about whether they can displace work to the evening? The relationship issues, new ways of living, um, being able to balance that with bolstering wellness to keep people going. The, the smaller challenges have become massive and we know that. So, but underpinning it all are all of these bigger causal factors. And I think as individual coaches and therapists, we're pretty, we feel pretty hopeless or helpless in dealing with that. Coming to the system issues, I think as a society, we've been able to push things aside until crises like this. But now we're being made more aware of the degradation of our social supports and the fault lines in our social, economic and democratic systems. How easily the international students have been dismissed, how easily whole sectors have been dismissed, like the entertainment sectors getting no supports. How these people keep going, I don't know. And we have come up under assumptions that you know, it's grown over recent years that we are here to serve the economy rather than the economy is here to serve the people. And I know through my um, economics training in the past that thriving societies are equitable and humane. And we've got that with countries around the world. As service providers, I think it behoves us to be very aware of these issues because we do have a voice because governments, no, no governments, neither private industry cannot deal with COVID consequences alone or any other shock. It's thrown into high relief that we need a government support system. That's what taxes are for. So, and funding for these services um, should be seen as an investment in the future. And to keep services alive, that service system should be funded. Why do some people get supports and not others? You know, what are the beliefs and assumptions that we can tackle around this? Some of them are happening, like some not-for-profits are now able to fund coaching services as well as um, counselling. Um, but then, you know, Medicare only funds psychiatrists, I believe. Oh, sorry, psychologists. <clears throat> um, we, after bushfires and through COVID, we've noticed that people in most need can't access supports. They just don't know where to go. The system itself is just inadequate. It's disconnected and we aren't connected as service providers. Now, some of that's our responsibility, but um, you know, we've got to have some motivation to do that. I actually had an experience recently where two days before a grant um, opportunity, I became aware of it, and two days before it was due in, uh, there was an opportunity to do some uh, collective action around mental health. And I had an idea, and I went to five other service providers. Four of them thought the ideas were really great, but during COVID in that year, uh, we couldn't meet the requirements because we had to earn a certain amount in the year before. And we were going to build, the idea was to build a regional support system linking the services. And each one was able to do, perform their services, but we set up the connections and links. I think that those sorts of ideas need to be worked through. Perhaps they've got some weight behind them. And I believe um, that we can't afford inaction anymore. Um, if we have an abundance mentality, the needs are enormous. 
um, more people are getting their voice and we're seeing that through Black Lives Matter and the calls of youth for having a better, better propositions for the future. And I know from my policy and uh, system experience, having worked in government, we do have the ability to influence and generate change. We've just got to get together to do it. So collaborative action is effective at all levels. Competitive action is not for our work. I'm not saying that standards and all of those things don't come into play. They can all be taken into account. So when we look at what's worked for COVID, why we've come off a lot better than other countries, and I have a lot of um, contacts in America and friends in America, and I can't tell you about the sadness and despair that's in their eyes um, and the sense of how we're ever going to get out of this. We have been better organised in Australia uh, because we have had a very strong public health history, even though it's been less and less funded over the years. And I'm a public health specialist in the past and I know what that's like, just fighting for funding all the time. But for the first time, we came back to the evidence, what that's based on. Rene mentioned the evidence around anxiety. We've all got our evidence bases. What are the threads that connect that evidence? What can we bring together to the table? Having done collective effort at a national level, I know it can be done. Um, we do have a lot of interrelationships um, and these were addressed much better in this country than they have been in a lot of countries, particularly America and England haven't measured up with this. We've, been, we've had a society in Australia where there's still a sense of community enough that hasn't been destroyed by competitive effort. Um, and we still have an adequate middle class, which has led that thinking, that we've been able to mobilise it. And I think it's time for the service sector to get on board with that. We keep on thinking about responding to emergencies with us all providing services. How do we do it as a norm? Um, we've been able to measure progress and outcomes because with COVID, we've been able to, particularly in um, New South Wales, has been pretty oriented towards data collection for a couple of decades because I know I was part of it. But areas where they let, you know, the public health effort to be underfunded, that's where, or well, Victoria, that's been one consequence. So, and there's been um, a great recognition in Australia that if we want health, we've got to actually have employment and we've got people to be fed. We've got people, um, people to, to, to obey the system so they can't, you know, so they, they don't have to balance decisions about, I know that I shouldn't go to work, but I have to because otherwise my family can't eat. So there's been a lot more recognition of the, the ripple effects. And I think that we as service providers um, focus so much on our technical expertise. It's very easy to forget the influence we might need to have on the systems and services around us. So I think our challenge for all of us um, is to as part of our service offering is to really get a good sense from clients is what they need as well as our service, what they need to change in their broader life, help them articulate those issues because often people aren't able to voice what they need. We have to stop waiting for government to act Many of us have um, gone singly or in small groups together, but I, I think it's time for more collective approaches. Otherwise, the status quo will eventuate. The lobbying, um, the strong lobbying effect of industry and big groups is profound. So, and this might take time. We've got to be patient. 
uh, some of the change that I was able to embed when I was in government um, took 10 years, but it's there. And I left in 2001 and it's still there. And those changes were introduced in the early 90s. So, but it took deep effort. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I believe if we can mobilise ourselves, talk more, I think forums like this are a clear opportunity to connect with each other. It's no one saying it's easy. We all want to go to heaven, but we have to die first, <laughs> transform our thinking, confront our own hesitations. Um, and, you know, it does take time, but the conversations can become better. So um, I think that requires us all to step into a form of leadership that we might not have thought about. And I'm, I'm actually really thinking about that at the moment because I think they're sort of super leaders, not positional leaders. We're not in organisations and going up the tree as some sort of professional leader, but we're entrepreneurial around services in a different way. And so as um, professional service providers, I'd love to see us at least make a dent in the system that we've got and change it. So we can be the difference that make a difference, share our services, skills and resources, at least think through some trajectory for clients and help them navigate very complex systems. And we can work out how to measure this and how we get standards. We could develop a vision of how it could be, think of ourselves as not individual system service providers, but system players, involve others. We could do things like scenario plan. Yes, it's complex, but you can always find some pathways and solving one problem frequently solves many. And we have to span boundaries. Our, our services will overlap. Some of the things that, that uh, Reno mentioned, I work on. And I've had a lot of training to do it. And, but it's not, it's not called therapy. Um, and we need to develop more evidence of what works. So these are the things of what we can do together that I just brainstormed and people might like to look at that slide, um, think about clients and their holistic needs, service referral pathways, collective effort, sometimes through industry groups, and maybe we start in a local area. So I think I need to stop there, Renee, I'm out of time. I wasted five minutes in the beginning, I'm sorry. No, excellent, it's all good, thank you. Um, so um, thanks so much, Margaret. And I guess I now just want to put it out. We've probably got time for maybe one question and then we'll need to hand it over to um, Neville. So anyone have a question for Margaret? A comment, a dispute? <laughs> a, a comment um, from Annette, be the change we wish to see in the world. I agree completely with you, Margaret, and also believe there's enough for all of us. That's from Annette. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Um, yeah, many thanks, Margaret, from, from Annette. Yeah, excellent. And I, I have to say, I agree with all your sentiments that you've brought in too. Um, an interesting, um, uh, in a former life, I taught at TAFE some community development stuff. So I'm, I'm with you 100%. Um, Margaret, we probably need to chat. Um, and Margaret's not far from me. Definitely, we need to talk, chat about some of this stuff. Awesome. Um, any other questions or comments? No? Okay, so we'll be moving over to Neville now. Um, if you can just stop your share, Margaret.